right, awesome guys. Thank you so much all for being here. Um, this is the very first uh, athlete series that we're doing here at the Virus Lab Seminar. Uh, my name is Matthew Boson. I'll get into a little bit more of kind of why I'm here and talking to you in a second. Um, obviously, Cub Swanson, ve uh, veteran UFC fighter, kind of one of my favorite all-time fighters. Uh, we kind of crossed paws a couple years ago um, uh, where I used to work at another, at another gym. Um, really just kind of touch base on philosophy and different training and things like that. Um, obviously, one of the best. Been at the top level for a very, very long time. Um, which is kind of what we'll get into speaking about more. There's obviously a huge part to the training side of things, but as an athlete, there's a lot to the recovery um, side of things as well. So, uh, Cub, a couple words from you? Uh, yeah, just, uh, you know, they asked me to come here and be a part of this. I'm like, <laughs> of course, um, going back to, to my long history of the virus, if you guys don't know, um, I'm, I'm virus's first uh, athlete. And uh, it, it was it was a mutual uh, great relationship from from the beginning. Uh, at the time, I was injured. Um, I had lost a fight, and um, I don't know. It's a weird situation when you're injured. Nobody really wants to in, in our sport. No one really wants to talk to you. It's like um, when you get a real bad injury. Nobody wants to associate with that because uh, we have this kind of blind fear. Like, um, that can't happen to me. I don't know if you guys saw Chris Weidman break his leg. Uh, you, stuff like that, you're like, oh, that's, that happened to him, not to me. That's not going to happen to me. That's that kind of this blinders put on. So when I was injured, nobody was calling me. Nobody was reaching out. Uh, it's just kind of the way it is. You, you feel uh, alone. I got a phone call from Virus, and they said, hey, we, uh, we want to be a part of your journey. We, we believe in you. And I was like cool let's do it and um i've watched them grow from uh you know a very small business to to what it is now. it's been awesome to watch and uh i always like to bring it up but even at that time they were only they were like no we only do white and black clothes that was their thing and i was like no man you guys need colors uh, and i'm glad to see they've evolved and uh they, they've done uh pretty well so yeah it's been it's been over 10 years and uh, yeah, so I'm excited to be here. Definitely, definitely. I think so. One of the uh, biggest things with Virus, right? It was started and created to basically take care of individual athletes. So it started off with sports like mixed martial arts, action sports, and things like that. Um, a lot of the gear, uh, tons and tons and tons of technology in it that we'll get into uh, in a second. Um, kind of tell me, Kyle, what was the first thing that you noticed that was different about the Virus kind of gear, quality, uh, how you felt after it compared to any of the other brands out there? Uh, the, uh, the first thing for me is at that time when they came to me, I was frustrated with uh, training gear in, in, in general. Um, I had even taken some pants, uh, they, they were some stretchy pants that I had, I think I had my mom sew them and I was, I was able to like slide my shin guards into them and I like made my own kind of football pads okay. but for MMA um, and people thought I was crazy. But it was like, I just wasn't satisfied with the products that people were putting out. Um, and then when I, you know, teamed up with Virus, they were like, well, what do you like? And, and try this sample, what would you change? So they, they let me put, give my input. Um, and that was huge. So that, you know, I, I think that's why they've uh, done so well is they, they're listening to, to the athletes and saying, what would you do? Um, and, and yeah, so I think that's why we've, we've come so far. Definitely. I think that's one of the biggest things with Virus, right, compared to some of the biggest uh, brands out there, is that they're taking feedback from the athletes themselves rather than the other way around and delivering it to the athlete being like, here you go, here's a t-shirt. Well, maybe I need a t-shirt, you know, especially like this X form, which I'll get into in a second, can actually change and improve your posture, as well as the bioceramic and the cool jade stuff. Really, really interesting in how that can actually change your physiology, which I'll get into a little bit more in a second. But again, the whole point of Virus and why it started was to take care of that individual, take care of that individual athlete, and then provide it to literally all of us, right? So we can get the same quality gear that some of the best athletes on the face of the earth uh, are getting access to as well. Um, I also think, and I love what Cub brought up, he's trialing different things. That's one of the biggest things with innovation, right? Is we're constantly pushing the envelope of what we can do, what we can one of the biggest things I love about virus is the technology and the way that it interacts and can change your physiology, which again, to a little bit more in a second because it can go quite over uh, some of our heads with the, in terms of the science and things like that, but it is quite, uh, quite interesting. Um, tell me, Cub, what was kind of the main reason that you said, I want to jump in, not only as one of the main athletes, but as somebody that's invested into the company as well? Um, yeah, like I said before, the 
them listening to the athletes has always been huge because uh, and we've talked about this before I've talked to you know dealing with trainers dealing with people they just they don't listen and it's like this is my business you know I'm, I'm you know self-employed uh, you know I'm my own business so listen to me I know what I'm doing I know what I'm talking about so it's that communication is huge um, but as far as, as some of the products that that I really enjoy is uh, is the the spandex I've learned over over the years the right amount of tension uh, prevents uh, like growing pools and things that I've that I've endured in, in my training and been able to be preventive over the years. Um, and then going as far as like the stay warm gear, I love it uh, because when I'm trying to cut weight, uh, me riding a bike in the stay warm pants, I start cooking right away and I sweat and that's what I need. That's what I need in my gear. So um, and then there's gear that, that keeps you cool. And you know, I've went out golfing in Palm Springs in a hundred and something degrees and I'm like, man, this, this you know, sun's not baking me. So. The, the the wide range of stuff they have it, it, it's been uh, it's been nice for me. Definitely, definitely. I think so. With some of the, uh, the the gear guys, if you don't and you're not all that familiar with um, some of the technology behind the gear, uh, bioceramic and cool jade, uh, as well as the X form right here, which I'll show you in a second. Basically, the way the way it works is that there's basically got bioceramic material that's brand down into a powder and basically infused into the garments. So when we talk about the compression, uh, things like recovery, right, increases nitric oxide, increases blood circulation, um, increases the uh, reduction and gets rid of a lot of free radicals, which is stress in the body. So again, we take this stuff from elite professional athletes at the highest level. Who doesn't want to get rid of stress, right? Like literally every single one of us. So you're telling me that I can go do a workout, throw on compression pants, and I'm instantly starting that recovery process right there? Absolutely. And again, that's the difference with virus gear compared to any of the other um, brands out there, right? This is, you know, patented intellectual property that only virus has. And again, that's the biggest difference. I think the biggest difference, too, with a lot of the gear, especially the compression, the reason why I noticed it uh, with Heber, right, is wearing the same shirt over and over and over again. I'm like, oh, do you have any other, like, no-gi training gear? And he starts laughing because I don't need any. I just need one shirt and I wash it. I was like, how do you have only one rash guard and you can keep training in it? Literally because the quality was that good. He'd had it for like about four years and it looked still brand spanking new. Again, that's the difference with virus. So I started paying attention like, wow, that's different. Right? Anybody done jujitsu? The gear we can get in jujitsu maybe, you know, 10 years ago was trash, right? It rips, it, it smells, you know, you wear it a couple times and it's gone. The stuff in virus compression as well also gets rid of the odor. So it doesn't smell. If anybody's worn it before, you can literally sweat in it all day long, smell it, it doesn't smell. It's quite mind blowing. Again, it's like, wow, the technology in these clothes, these clothes are like helping me help be healthier, helping me recover while I'm wearing them without even doing anything. So it's like, we kind of start taking that approach to, to the clothing, the things that we do and wear, it kind of changes the game a little bit, right? <laughs> Makes sense? Tell me, have you guys worn any of the compression gear from virus in terms of recovery? Anybody? No? I started, uh, I, started, I remember I started a Sub Cub at, I think it was a Fit, fit Expo in LA, and they had a, they had a booth and they had just started setting it up, and I think it was like the, like a black compression shirt with the yellow. No, oh, okay. Uh, it's like one of the first early arms, but, uh, Sports and I noticed I pulled a hamstring. And I don't know if anyone's ever pulled a hamstring, but once you pull a hamstring, it's, there's like a like a sense in your body that at any given moment that thing's gonna go. And I mean, it had been at this point, it had been like a year, year and a half. And I remember buying. I got an email from Virus and they had a sale, and I was like, I'm gonna try this compression uh, pants out. And uh, immediately it was like uh, those pants that you put on the icy hots, but immediately. I felt and like slowly but surely as I did anything competitive, whether it was running or, 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 or uh, wrestling or jiu-jitsu, I noticed that I wasn't worried about exploding anymore because I knew that my left hamstring was comfortable because of the warmth and the compression that the pants provided. So now, anytime I do anything like that, there's no other product that I'm wearing besides that. Well. Especially when you're getting older, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's your 20 year, 21 year reunion. Because yeah. I'm right there with you. We went to high school together, so. 
Okay. Cool. So great example there. Um, again, anecdotes, that's the best. Get out there and try this stuff, guys. If I could recommend, jump in a workout. As soon as you're done with that workout, throw that compression on, whether, whether it's the shirt, whether it's the pants. I always recommend the pants because our legs absolutely take a, a, a flogging. The compression, especially, I'm going to show you over this one here, right? It's graded. So you can see here, it's graded as it comes up, right? So it's to improve circulation from the feet up. So little things like that. Again, I don't know a brand out there that's got little subtle differences like that, right? It's the attention to detail that I love about Virus. And again, it sets it apart from pretty much any other brand out there. Um, next part we're going to get into, guys. Uh, and yes, we're all aware that they're very hard to take off when you're wet. Yes. <laughs> right? we, all, we all have the same struggle, yeah. <laughs> Um, again, I think one of the biggest things for um, training is always the recovery side, right? There's so many people out there, you know, so many different trainers, strength and conditioning coaches like that. Anybody can make you tired. Anybody can, uh, yeah, make you sweat. The difference is how is that going to actually improve? And something that Cub and I have talked about a lot a couple years ago, we talked to a number of uh, coaches and athletes, is really focusing on that recovery aspect, right? That's the biggest difference. Again, anybody can go out and run, you know, two hours straight. What are you going to do after that? Then different things come into play in terms of habits. So we're talking about nutrition we're talking about you know hydration we're talking about um, you know things like again the compression gear recovery things like that you start pairing all of these things together now all of a sudden you've got your own essentially professional elite level recovery protocol makes sense and of course that's what we all want right as a professional athlete you get these coaches and people that dedicate their lives to improving that we want to try to expand that out to everybody else right because there's so many different things that we're all doing we want to make sure that we're improving we're uh, you know reducing the risk of injury and different things like that so like jr said when he's wearing the compression it actually helped the hamstring so now he can get that little bit of confidence got that warmth he's got that you know uh increase in the nitric oxide increase in the blood circulation can actually improve performance and that's one thing that we always look at what prevents injury also improves performance right because if you're injured then there is no performance whatsoever makes sense so i think that's kind of again one of the biggest differences and why i love the brand of virus is geared toward that recovery aspect right and we're recovering better we're also performing better too so we can talk like the stay cool stay cool the jade stuff right it is actually scientifically proven that it keeps your skin 10 degrees cooler than on the outside versus the stay warm they flip it around it keeps your skin 10 degrees warmer right so therefore it increases even more um now get into a little bit guys about the actual i guess scientific principles of how the bioceramic works uh mel sent me the uh, research absolutely mind-blowing i just got into it about a week ago going down a rabbit hole i'm sure in a few months time i'll have a ton more stuff for you guys but basically if i could explain the way that the bioceramic works in terms of how it affects our physiology. So basically, guys, if we go all the way back to science class, you know what an atom is, right? You guys seen an atom? You guys seen a picture of an atom, right? It's a little ball, and it's kind of circles the way it moves. That's essentially how the atom vibrates. Now, what happens with the bioceramic that's infused in the gear, when we wear that, it's so close to the atoms in our body, it starts changing the way that it interacts with everything else. So that's why it can do things like increase nitric oxide, increase um, the reduction of free radicals, which is stress and different things like that in the body. So if we kind of think, okay, how, how does that work? Literally put it on, wear it. It's so close to our skin and to our cells, it's going to start changing the physiology. ton of research out there can do things like reduce inflammation um, for rheumatoid arthritis, which is quite interesting. Looking at further their applications like okay cool as I'm getting older you're telling me that I can wear these clothes and it's gonna help the feeling of my bones and joints and everything else yeah absolutely right that's a little interesting to me I don't know another clothing brand on the face of the planet that's doing quite those types of things makes sense so it's quite fascinating to me again so I always come at this from the most geeky scientist nerd you know point possible but again it's like how can we take that information how can we take that build it into a protocol for the athletes to then improve their overall performance as well makes sense any got any questions on the science or anything like that about the garments yes no maybe so no any questions at all so far no excellent all right you guys are talking a bunch today, I huh? I feel like I feel like you guys got questions. You got questions for me? When's your next fight? My next fight. I'm hoping to fight October, November. Yeah, so okay. I'm just getting back into shape. There you go. There you go. Awesome. On your uh, recovery days, do you have any days where you just don't do like any cardio or like oh, yeah. weightlifting? Yeah. Uh, usually on my days off, I don't do anything. I'll I'll walk around a little bit play with my kids but uh yeah if I'm gonna do anything 
As I've gotten older, I've gotten a lot more in touch with my body and on how it works. And so I've realized even more that your body is gonna do whatever you need it to right at that time. So um, where you, you asked an important question, if I do anything on my rest day, what I'll do is if I take two days off, like if, I, if I'm done Friday and I take Saturday completely off, I'll try to take Sunday off too, but at Sunday night, I'm gonna do uh, like a good cardio workout. Nothing too strenuous, but um, like I'll ride my bike and I'll just, I'll do no resistance and just pedal to do cardio. And what I'm doing is I'm waking my body back up because I've noticed that if you, you know, if, if, you're, if you're grinding for two, three days in a row, your body wants to keep doing it, you wanna keep doing it, but you're gonna start you know, trashing your body, right? You're gonna start going into a hole and you need to pull back. Well, once you pull back and you stop, your body's like, hey, let's do this. I like this shit, let's, let's do this, right? So to be able to wake up Monday morning and go hard, for, for me, means sparring, people are trying to take you down, they're trying to punch you in the face, right? That, that's a huge wake up call Monday morning. So Sunday night, I'll do a workout to kind of wake myself back up. That way when I wake up Monday morning and I start warming up, I'm, I'm already ready. My, my body's like, okay, we're starting the week again, right? Whereas if I took two days off and I didn't do anything, then Monday morning, my body's like, Ugh, and I'm like in slow motion and my body's not really ready to get back into that grind. When ev everybody else in the room is, it's gonna be bad for me. So for me, it, that it's a really complicated question. Like, it depends what you have next. You know, if your next day is hard, then you need to do something. If your next day is gonna be easy, then you could do nothing that day and then use the next day to be your easy, you know, kind of warm up for what's coming next. But if you have a hard session that next morning, then you better do something the night before. So yeah, that's, that's just what I've learned. And I think it's important to know your guys' own bodies and what makes you, you know, what makes you you. But yeah, question. Any other questions? I mean, this is what I'm here for, so. How's your nutrition on the full rest day like that? Are you still pretty like? So, yeah, so when I feel my body, uh, so I'm dieting all the time, right? And when I get, when I'm this far out, like I say, I'm gonna fight October, November. I'm dieting a couple of days in a row and then I'm cheating and then a couple of days. And so I do that on purpose. And then the closer I get to my competition or where I think I'm gonna be, I start cutting things out more and, and I get tighter and tighter. So it's no, there's no change. It's just, I'm not cheating as much and then I'm getting real strict. And then it's kind of like a warm up, you know? So it's easy for me to do it that way. Um, on my recovery days, let's say I usually take Wednesdays off, so I'll go really hard uh, Monday, Tuesday, and, and do three workouts in a day, four workouts sometimes. And so Wednesday, I'm, I'm trashed. So Tuesday night, if I feel my body kind of almost feeling like I'm gonna get sick, like if your body feels very vulnerable, you're tired, you try to go to sleep, and you're just kind of tossing and turning, that means you're overtrained. That means your body's like, what did you do to me? You know, it, that's, that's when you need the recovery day. So days like that, I'll actually try to eat more vegetables. If, if I'm doing carbs, uh, I'll, I'll eat like a big thing of pasta. Like I give my body something to help fight back, right? Like I'll give it the, those nutrients so that way my recovery day is, is you know, better. And, and I give my body that fuel. So it's like, it's really important to, to listen to your body. Um, it just depends, uh, but yes, a lot of times stand up will be in the morning and grappling will be at night. Um, I think it's funny because you just tend to be more lazy at night, and so you're, you'd rather be like, all right, I'm already tired, we'll start on the ground and grapple. Um, and in the mornings you got more energy, you want to be standing, moving around. So that, that tends to be how it is, um, but yeah, usually morning or night, but yeah, I. I you could always switch it up. Some people will do one week of stand-up, a week of grappling. Um, it just depends what works for you. Uh, and for sparring, do you recommend going live or just doing it at like a low percentage? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. So 
I think it's very important uh, earlier in your career, career to go hard and really like, I think it's important to overtrain and go a little bit too hard when you're early in your career because it weeds out all the people that shouldn't be there, right? Because most of the people that don't have what it takes, like if, you, if you're trying to be an MMA fighter and you're in the lower circuit, let's say your first eight fights, right? Uh, all the guys that aren't tough, they won't last through the, those eight fights. They'll, they'll quit, right? And all the tough guys, they're, they're just gonna last through that. Now, who makes it past that is being a little bit more intelligent and being naturally gifted and having good coaching and all those things, right? They're gonna help you take that next level, right? And that kind of separates. So early on in your career, I think it's important to do all the, the hard stuff, show what you're made of because there's gonna be situations where you're gonna get um, in, a, in a bad spot. You know, you're gonna get your ass kicked. Um, you know, I've had fights where I had a, a, a broken rib and a broken nose and then I, I pulled out a win. It's like, well, if you weren't going hard in training at all, you might not have that, that grit in you, you know? So it's important to know when to have hard days and when not to have hard days. Now at the age I'm at now, with how many rounds I've had sparring, I do a lot less hard sparring and more technical sparring. Um, and I think the biggest key on your sparring is who's watching, if your, your coach is watching. Um, and I've learned that with uh, me having a gym for you know over 10 years, is when I'm there, <laughs> especially guys, uh, they start sparring, and, and I'm like, hey, stop, chill out, let's, let's tone it down. And then they're like, well, he hit me hard. Well, he hit me hard. It's the same shit all the time. It's, it's always pointing fingers. He started it. It's like, no, you both are idiots. <laughs> Calm down and go light. So things just escalate. So I think the most important thing is to have a third person, a referee, a coach, someone saying, hey, guys, come on. The level is here. This is where we're trying to keep it. We're keeping the level here so we can both work. If you want to kick each other's ass, then do that somewhere else. So, because uh, that's when I feel like you get a little bit away from uh, the technical side of it, you know, learning. Because uh, in sparring, you're looking for those quick, the quick t uh, twitch moves, you know, where he, you know he's going to throw a jab and you're going to slip and pull and throw the right. Well, you just want to be able to work that timing. You don't want to be trying to knock the guy out and then you don't have a training partner anymore, right? And then you're, you're giving him bad habits, so. In general, I'm not a big fan of sparring super hard, but I think it is necessary early in your career to kind of see what you're made of, and then I think you, to do less, because you want to save some brain cells for, you know, the rest of your life. Thank you. Uh, what kind of, like, stretching do you do, like, before, after, on your recovery days? Um, I, I like to do kind of a dynamic stretch, you know, just kind of moving around. Um, as a kid, it was funny, you know, I grew up playing soccer and we used to run the field and do all these stretches together. And I just get at a point you're kind of like, why do we even do these? I've never hurt anything. Well, yeah, when you're like 11, you're not really pulling any muscles. I learned when I got older, like, if I'm gonna be able to maintain training three, four times a day, you can't stiffen up. And, uh, and it, you'll actually, like, you'll literally prevent surgeries. Um, I had an elbow surgery um, and I learned that it was just from not stretching my tricep. I guess people don't ever stretch their triceps. And so what happens is it gets tight, starts pulling, uh, creates inflammation and, and you get calcium buildup. And then with all the kickboxing, I took a kick right here and I uh, had a piece of bone floating around um, and getting caught in the joint. So when I picked up my phone, I, my arm didn't move, it just stuck. And then when I wiggled it around, it moved and then I could move it again. So I had to go get it scoped out. And that's all just from not stretching. It's, it's, it's stupid, but Time, you know, stretching keeps you limber, it keeps you loose. Now you can also overstretch, um, and we've talked about this, but we were at, a, you know, Bikram Yoga has gotten big, 
and uh, we were doing it in Albuquerque and I noticed that when I was doing hot yoga that I wasn't explosive anymore the next day. So what happens is we put ourselves in a hot room and your muscles are like rubber bands, right? So you pull them a little bit too much and stretch them out. Well, they're not, they're not stretchy anymore, right? It's not gonna have any pop. So when I try to be explosive, I'm a little flat and I don't feel the same. And I realized that if you're gonna do hot yoga and stretch these muscles beyond a regular stretch, then you need a day or two to let them go back to the way they were before you could be explosive. So I learned that I started seeing people get injured from that. So like I said, you can overstretch. You know? So it's really just about getting your body loose, getting it warm and, and preparing for whatever you're gonna be doing. Like for me right now, I'm getting back into my sport. So it's a lot of overall conditioning so that I can be able to hold that load, right? Like right now I can't jump into four training sessions a day with hard sparring. I, I would hurt myself. So I have to spend a month running, doing all these things, push-ups, pull-ups, like all body weight stuff, a little bit of lifting to basically get my body prepared to be able to handle what I'm gonna do to it. Answer your question? Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. Uh, not as much as I should. I, I would like to. I just can't. There's not enough hours in the day. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's something that I think everyone should do. Um, but yeah, there's only so many things you can do. You know, you got your cardio, weightlifting, you got jujitsu, uh, wrestling, boxing, kickboxing, uh, kids. <laughs> Traveling, yeah, yeah. So, what's really what really has uh, lacked for me was um, stretching because before, when I didn't have kids, that was my routine was to, you know, watch TV, lay on the floor, stretch in between training sessions, whatever I felt tight. It's like I don't need, I don't want that to be tight. So let me work on that and then go back to training, feeling good. Now I sit on the floor. I got kids jumping on me, so I I realize I tend to do it less. Um, but I still have to find a time that where I can do it because it's essential and you know you don't want to hurt something because you because you just were too lazy. Yeah. Great question. Uh, you got Anyone more? Yeah, yeah, I got a couple. Um, what I mean, obviously, you've been around for a long time at the top of the game for a very long time, which especially in mixed martial arts, right, is very very rare. Um, what do you think, maybe? things that you could attribute to having that longevity in this career? Uh, a Anything couple, like mindset, training, yeah. recovery. I mean, it's an accumulation it, of lots of things, right? Okay, so there, there's a bunch of things. Uh, it's a tough question, too. But take notes, people. This is, this is the money question. For mentally, mentally, it's, it's difficult. So as a fighter, right, you, you're almost in the beginning stages of being a fighter, you're like, like a, you know, like a dog, you know, like that's like a dog, fight, right? You're, you, you do what you're told, you don't ask questions, that's how you're taught, right? And you get the sense of you're trying to be the best, right? So you kind of hypnotize yourself over time, like I'm the best. So you start, that's why you need a manager because what happens is a promoter is gonna say, hey, we want you to fight this guy, he's five and oh, and you, it's your first fight, but don't worry, he's not that good. That, that's how you get screwed, that's, how, that's what happens, that's how it works, right? So you need a manager to say, no, let's not fight that guy, but in my mind, I'm like, I'll beat that guy. <laughs> yeah. Who is he, he hasn't fought me. Like, that's our mindset, right? So that mindset is what makes us uh, great and wanna ch chase greatness. The problem with that is that you lose. Then what happens? You, you, you're, it's like your ego, everything just takes a shot, right? So you have to be able to, how do you come back from that? And I've watched fighters do it all the time. One, they make excuses. Oh, it's because I slipped, it's because of this. Um, I won't lose the next one. And they basically talk themselves into it being a fluke and, and the next one they'll be fine. And that works for a short amount of time. Um, there is other fighters that'll say, I made a mistake, I need changes. They'll change gyms, they'll change trainers, they'll, 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 they'll look at everything, right? And there's other people that just go, I just need to get better. 
and and they will look inside and really see like what is it in me um, that I can change but it's really those three things that are going to go into your mind and that's the only way you're going to move forward because if you just lost to somebody and you know okay I'm obviously not the best in the world right now because I just <laughs> lost to somebody how do I go back out there and fight this guy now when I just lost to this guy is a very hard mental battle and that's why I always respect watching fighters uh, fight after they've lost because you see the real battle it's like it, it's terrifying my my first fight, I wasn't even that scared. My second fight, I was terrified because I lost my first fight and I knew, I was like, oh shit, I'm gonna do this again? Well, I don't wanna do this. Why did I say I was gonna do this? <laughs> They're like, it's terrifying. So uh, another thing you'll, you'll learn about fighters is the day of the fight is when you start to question yourself. You have all the mental battle and I'm sure you guys have been there in, in gym sessions. It's like all of a sudden you're just terrified of, of this moment, right? It, it's part of it. So going back to what we were saying, um, for me, I think one of the reasons why I've been able to come back so many times is I've never thought of myself as uh, like a winner or a loser. I always thought of myself as a prototype of what I was trying to be. And so uh, I didn't realize this till later, but every time I lost, I, I kind of thought to myself, okay, this version of me wasn't as good, but I will rebuild and this version of me is better. Okay, I lost. Now I'm gonna rebuild and this version of me is better. And I've been able to keep putting out versions of myself, you know, for, for people to see my, you know, my martial arts talent um, many times now. And if it wasn't for that mentality, I definitely uh, wouldn't have take those losses. Um, and, and, and I think that's one of, the, one of the reasons why I've been able to have a longer career. Um, another reason is I've always allowed people around me to be um, open. Like if someone tells me they think I don't work hard, I'll, I'll probably get upset, um, but I will listen. If you think like I'm slacking it in a certain part of my game, I'll listen um, and I'll, I'll take I'll take the criticism. I've always been open to criticism, but I will also give it back. If you're a part of my camp and you're criticizing me, I'm gonna say, okay, I heard you, but I, I, need, I have some things I gotta say and, and, and I'll give it back. And sometimes trainers don't like that. Um, but I feel like the open line of communication is what helps you know, take you to new heights. Um, and then the, the one of the, I'll say the third thing that has kept me along kept me at the at the highest level in this game is always looking for patterns of um, what's coming next and, and you know it's just like with the stuff with virus you know a clothing company like this it's like what's the newest trend what are people into what what can we bring to the table that people don't even know they want yet that's that's what we are looking for so for for me as a fighter I think what had me success for a long period of time was my boxing. And that's because in the game, there were no boxing coaches at the time that would allow anybody into their gyms. All the boxing coaches that were the best boxing coaches in MMA at the time, when I would ask my boxing coach, hey, do you know this guy? And they're like, oh, that guy, the guy that holds the bucket? Like, they were nobodies. Uh, so it was funny when I actually had a boxing coach that was one of the best in the world compared to other people's coaches that were nobodies. Um, I, I saw that as an opportunity for me to be ahead of the curve that nobody had those boxing skills that I had at the time. Now a lot of boxing coaches have come around and people's stand-up game has gotten a lot better so I've had to find new ways to uh, be ahead of the curve. I think now what we're seeing in MMA is distance, distance and angles. Um, whoever controls the distance of the fight is going is going to win the fight, and and that's why we're seeing more success with karate guys now, um, because they're masters of distance, right? It, it's hard to it's hard to get to them. You, you try to reach and get them, and they're going to hit you in the face. So they're they're the master of distance, right? So that's. That's kind of like how you you're able to see like where your sport is, where it's going, what are the trends, who's winning, 
uh, why is, why does this team keep winning? Like you gotta you gotta be really into that. You gotta obsess about it. So that's the long answer to why <laughs> I've been successful for a long time. Absolutely. Yeah. Just real quick, I, I just I mean, following your career, I I know that you've always never gone up too high weight. And as a strength and conditioning coach, a lot of times from our end, we get athletes who come in and, you know, like they're young and they, and they think, oh, I can drop these 10, 15 pounds or more, or more sometimes. Uh, real quick, coach, because as strength and conditioning coaches, I've been talking about with, with Joel is that I feel like strength and conditioning coaches recently over the last like four or five years have started to become an intricate part. Because boxing, um, boxing's behind right. MMA. So, boxing's learning from MMA on how to be an athlete. Because, so, in MMA, the older school guys, like my era uh, and before, it was, you were either a street fighter or a martial artist, right? Those are the two people coming into the sport. Okay, now street fighters, they're just tough and gritty and they're down to throw down. That, that's it, right? And then they learn moves and they learn discipline, right? Then you have your martial artists that they're all about the, the discipline and, and the art and, the, and, and they, wanna, they wanna learn the art and everything is about the technique. And then now that the sport has gotten some money and it's cool, uh, you're getting a lot more athletes, right? And athletes come in, they know about their body and they know how to uh, get their body in the best shape possible. Now, the problem with that is they may not have that street fighter mentality and they might not be have that martial arts passion. So the, the, the ideal way is to have all three. But boxing in general, what he's saying, uh, they're so old school. They're barely learning to have conditioning coaches. I mean, it's, it's funny, like uh, a boxer will wear a, a um, a suit every day for a month leading up to his fight and I'm like how many pounds is, is he over and they're like two he has two pounds and I'm like two pounds I wake up the morning of my fight uh, 10 pounds over I wake up 155 and I cut 10 pounds in two hours before I go to weigh-ins I'll make 145 on the dot and I've been doing that for a long time so it, it, to me it's like it's baffling it's very different um, but Yes, that is a very big thing is, is weight. Um, it, it really got summed up very easy to me. Okay, I'm gonna start camp. We're, we have three months to do camp, right? And that's a long camp. I like three months. Most people don't, they do six weeks. Uh, and no coach is like, well, is this fight camp or fat camp? And that, that sums it up right there because, okay, are we gonna spend this next three months trying to work on skills so that you could be the best version of you or are we going to spend the whole time doing cardio and trying to get your weight down and trying to make sure you don't get injured because you feel depleted the entire time your sparring is going to be shit because you're, you're you're not eating very much and they're they're teeing off on you and we got to like pull back say, hey don't hit them like take it easy on them so that's fat camp you're getting to the fight and just making it there on weight like that that's not acceptable so yeah I always tell so fighters have like a fighters and wrestlers have a thing with the scale they're terrified of it I get on the scale often even out of camp uh, almost every morning because I want to know what am I waking up at and I always tell everyone have a magic number for me <clears throat> Anything over 175, I fight at 145. Anything over 175, if I hit 176, it doesn't matter if I'm on vacation, it doesn't matter. I have to diet, I have to get on the treadmill, I need to, I need, I'm, I'm overboard, right? And guys don't do this. They don't wanna look at the scale for three, four months, and then it's like, I force them to get on, I'm, they're like, oh, I'm 180. And they get on, they're like 198. And I'm like, dude, what the fuck, you know? Like, and they're like, oh, I didn't think I was that heavy. It's like, well, it's because you're not holding yourself accountable. You know, you need to get on that scale. You need to know, like, okay, this is my limit. Okay, I can, I can have fun in this window, but once I hit this, this limit right here, it's time to get back to work. Because you know that if you get too far over that limit, how hard it's gonna be to get back down. So, you know, it, 
as an athlete, it's year round and you got to hold yourself accountable. So I think it's, it's very big that you, you set that mark. If you get over this mark, you need to start training immediately. And I think that's what keeps people in check. And that's what's always kept me, you know, and me knowing as I've gotten older, it's like, okay, it's going to be harder to lose weight. So you need to be even, so these last few years, I've even been five to eight pounds less than I normally was all the time, just because I know that as I'm getting older, it's not going to be as easy. So you have, it's a very important part is where are you starting from that number? Because losing 40 pounds in a camp is different than losing 20 pounds in a camp. I, I would bet on the guy that's only losing 20. Absolutely. This is a great question. I think, you know, again, that's why the Cubs so good. Is that consistency, right? Consistency year round. If you're an athlete, you're an athlete, right? Like you don't have periods, extended periods of where not fighting, where you're not doing any type of training at all. Like, sure, maybe you're not doing your, your sparring and your jujitsu and things like that, but you got to keep your physical body, right? And again, like the point, you know, somebody versus uh, uh, losing 40 pounds versus 20 pounds, think about your body's metabolic load and stress when it's trying to lose 40 pounds versus 20 pounds, right? So it's like as you're getting ready for the fight, you want to show up on fight day ready to go and ready for the fight not tired you know not your uh, nervous system fried you're lethargic right depending on how you cut weight that's right that's another whole kettle of fish we could be here for four hours just talking about weight cut strategies right especially in MMA and boxing that's a, a that's a major thing so I think to uh, to JR's question something that I've seen as, as a high performance the best MMA fighters are the ones that are consistent and they don't go up and down massively. The ones that do, again, usually you're going to see inconsistency in their performance as well because you're seeing that inconsistency essentially in their life and their daily habits, right? So something talk about is just doing small things daily so back to your question about like do you stretch or things like that there's a lot of hours or sorry there's not a lot of hours in a day especially for MMA we've got all these different things you're working on so maybe rather than having you know like an hour a week where you're doing you know a bunch of yoga maybe just do five ten minutes a day every single day right very very quickly you do that six to seven days out of the week now you've been doing it for more than an hour and your body's constantly getting that stimulus it's constantly um, used to that consistency and again that's going to lead to a much better performance in, in the long run and less stress when you're trying to uh, cut weight and different things like that. Would you agree with that, right? Athletes that kind of stay more even keel, always much better success in the long run, especially in these sports, for sure. Yeah, I agree. And it's professionalism, you know? It, you know, there's a point in, in our careers where we kind of laugh about how heavy we get and how we can bounce back, but in the long run, it's, it's not smart. It, it, you know, and, and for fighters, it's, it's very normal to have, like, multiple sizes uh, of clothes in our in our closet it's like you know it's funny i go to dress up nice and i'm like i have two sets i have like stuff from the week of my fight and stuff when i'm out of camp and i try to wear the other stuff sometimes and i'm like that's a little fit. tight. I think, too, um, JR, so coming from a boxing standpoint, I think this, the, well, I don't think, I've seen it firsthand, the science in, in all of this stuff and strengthening, initiating, and performance has, has skyrocketed. Boxing, I don't know what it is about boxing, but it's probably one of the most stubborn sports in the face of the, on the face of the earth. These guys will not stop running road miles. Like, what are you doing? Your fight's, you know, 10 to 15 minutes long, and you're running for hours and hours and hours and hours. Like, you're not, an, you're not a long-distance runner. Let's run less. Let's maybe eat a little better, do a little yoga. Now your performance is going to be exponentially better just from that. Again, you're not spending that metabolic load and stress on the body by just running and running and running and running, right? So I think in boxing, it, it has got a long way. And now it's kind of shifted, right? Because MMA back, when, when did you start fighting, even training? 2003. 2000, 2003, yeah. Uh, has changed exponentially, right? It was kind of like MMA was the little brother to boxing and kind of karate and things like that. Now MMA is almost like the biggest and fastest growing one out there, right? Like it's just totally changed the game. So now boxing and some of the other combat sports are starting to learn from mixed martial arts, right? Because there's an absolute ton of more science now compared to, you know, 10, 15 years ago. It's completely changed. Um, even myself, I did a little bit of jiu-jitsu, absolutely not the athlete here, Cub is. Uh, but again, when I first started training about 2005, it was again, coach said, hey, go out and, you know, run 20 miles, then come back and we're going to do jiu-jitsu for an hour. What? You're going to make me tired and then make me do jiu-jitsu? Like, I'm not even gonna be listening to my coach anymore. I'm not even learning skills because I'm literally just so tired. I'm trying to survive. So it's, again, that kind of difference in something that we talk about. We try to categorize uh, MMA uh, athletes or fighters into three different categories. So you got athletes, you got competitors, and then you got fighters. So like Cubs said, right, that fighter is just that, you know, I'll fight you in the street right here, right now. Let's go to the parking lot. Then you have the competitor that just wants to compete, right? So that's a guy competing in training, won't tap in jiu-jitsu, right? Just 
just a dog and just wants to compete. Then you have the athlete, and the athlete is somebody that's got good habits, that takes care of their physical body, that might have a little bit more in terms of the mental side of things. So it's really, there's pros and cons to all three of those. What you got to do as an individual, as an athlete, is find which ones of those are your strengths and weaknesses, right? We double down on our strengths, and we start focusing on the weaknesses a little bit, right? So you might be a fighter and a competitor, but you don't have the best, you know, diet, or you don't have the best daily habits. Well, then as a coach, then I would implement protocols and strategies to improve that a little bit, right? So again, doing little bits and pieces, you know, stretching 10 minutes a day here or there, improving your hydration, right? Little things like that. And I always come at it from the standpoint of human performance first. I want to make sure that you're healthy, right? If you're coming in and you're, hey, hey, coach, I got a fight in three months, bro, you're 40 pounds overweight. You're, you're not even an athlete right now, again. So it's like, we got to spend the first part of this camp as fat camp. Now I love that, fat camp versus fit camp, right? And you see that time and time again, again, especially the amateur guys or the ones on, on that kind of lower tier. The biggest thing for them to make that jump is to get consistent, to be more you know, consistent in, in being an athlete first, right? Taking care of the human side of things. So making sure you're eating right, making sure you're getting enough hydration, making sure you're getting electrolytes, making sure you're sleeping. If you're not doing one of those three things, sorry, but we're not even gonna be talking about high performance yet. Make sense? So a lot of that is just habits. And I've seen you know professional fighters, and I'm kind of like, are you really? Like, if you calling yourself a professional athlete, I'm gonna call professional athlete because my daily habits are 100 times better than yours. Maybe I'm not getting paid to play, but hey, that's okay. I've still got more better habits, right? So it's always coming at it from a human standpoint first, and then we start putting the building blocks on top of that in terms of the athlete performance stuff. So that's skills, that's now strength and conditioning, that's a training, you know, recovery, whatever it might be from there. Make sense? A great question, JR. Excellent. Uh, this question is kind of more about yes, coaching. Mm -hmm. So I know like a lot of people talk about like, oh, how do you deal with like self doubt or when you lose whatever? How do you deal with, like as a coach when you have like a, a student or whatever who's like really struggling like with the sport or whatever? You know they either have to do it or they really want to, but they're having self doubt or having a lot of issues, coming off loss or whatever, coming off an injury. How do you deal as kind of like a coach or a mentor? So I mean that that's very difficult to to say because. Um, I think that you really can't be a great coach unless you know the athlete very well, like on a personal level. Um, because it, you, you kind of almost got to know their childhood. You got to know like, like what makes them tick, you know? Like there's people that on the outside, they look like they're, they're tough and they won't ever say that they're scared or anything, but they are. And it's frustrating because they're very proud and they'll, they'll just be like, yeah, I got it. And you're like, you good? Yep, I'm good. But inside they're terrified and they won't tell you. So you need to know like they, they are scared. They, they, they need that push and you gotta be behind them going, hey, you, you're the best, you're the best, you got this. And they need that. And there's other people that, that need, that have too much confidence and you need to say, hey, be aware of this. Don't don't overestimate the, or underestimate this person. You need to you need to be. You kind of need to get them to have some fear because they perform better with fear. Um, it, there's people that if you put too much pressure on them, they they break, and you kind of got to push them the right way. So I, I really believe that if you don't know somebody like. Uh, you know, like really know them, then, then you can't help them as good as, as somebody else that knows them really well. Uh, and I see it happen all the time. Um, that's one of my things is when I watch fights, I like to hear what the corner's saying because I hear terrible advice all the time. <laughs> uh, and it bums me out, you know? And I like, like one, one topic that gets brought up often is about like throwing in the towel. So it's like as a fighter, like uh, when I fought Frankie Edgar, I always use this one because I, I was on a tear uh, and then we fought the first time, he, he beat me up real good. And I was like, like, all right, like you ain't gonna, I just want to keep smiling at him. Like, like uh, you ain't gonna break me, dude. You know, like you're kicking my ass, but you're not gonna break me. But after that five rounds going home and then having my equilibrium off and, and that was the first time I had vertigo and I had like my head was messed up um, from taking too many shots that I shouldn't have taken. Now looking back, I feel like, man, I really wasn't trying to win, I was trying to survive, right? If I really wanna, you know, analyze my fight. So my coaches, I think they should have stopped the fight, right? And so now I see it all the time. I see fighters that are like, I got it, coach. Yeah, no problem. 
because that's how we're, we're built. That's how we're trained. You, you keep going. There, there's always a chance. That's, that's the mentality you have, right? But sometimes it takes somebody else to say, hey, let's go back to the drawing board. Let's not take more damage. Let's not take two years off your, your career. You know, let's, let's save you for another day. So all those things are super important. And I think if you know your fighter very you're better to answer those questions. You, you know what makes them tick than some other person who's a great coach but doesn't know that person. I think relationship's the biggest thing, right? Like you need to know whether that individual is intrinsically or extrinsically motivated, right? Like do they want this just for them or do they want this for the big trophy and everything else, right? Because that's going to significantly change the way that you communicate with them, the way that you deal with them, the way that you motivate them, all of those types of things, right? I think in ter to answer your question from, from my point, from, from a coaching standpoint, Anytime you get any athlete losing, right, it's always like, what can we learn from that? You know, the, the old uh, saying, you win or you learn. Yeah, we lose, we get that, but you always learn, right? There's always the next opportunity. There's always a way to get better. There's always something else to improve. So if you're looking at that, and again, why I love Cub, I, I look at myself, or sorry, he looks at himself like a prototype, right? That's perfect for me. That ties straight into that. You're constantly learning. You're constantly getting better. So even the fights that you win, okay, what can I do better and improve on for the next time, right? It's Because it's never the same fight. It's never the same fighter. Even if you are fighting the same guy, right, it's completely different strategy they might have a completely different strategy right everything's always changing especially in MMA it's one of my favorite sports for that reason right it's so there's so many different variables and there's always something to learn there's always something to get better from right been in the top of the game and still probably learning right every practice every drill always there's always something to get better at and something to improve um, sorry we'll get you next <laughs> Um, I've taken some losses too, and it's really hard, it was really hard for me to look back at that video and learn from it. Mm -hmm. uh, do you recommend looking back at that video and how learning your mistakes, mm -hmm. even though it's hard to live that, that loss? Yeah, yeah. I mean, my last fight, I haven't watched it once, mm -hmm. and I will, but I'm not ready. Like, I, I, I have my reasons, but I will, you know, and I'll force myself to. I'll go back, uh, my, uh, my manager would always make me watch videos from like, six years ago it's like are you still that guy you know like those are all very useful information that that's that's a version of yourself at that point in time and you need to watch it you need to see there's there's things you did well there's things that you didn't do well there's things that when you watch it you go i remember that i remember that feeling you know and and that can be tough you know especially coming off of losses is you can relate that feeling of of um, failing to, to, to just fighting in general and going, oh, I'm gonna fight again. I only remember that feeling of, of losing. And, and you, you have to deal with that, you have to address it, you know? And that's part of the mental side. And uh, yeah, I, I think it can definitely be tough. Uh, it's, it, it's funny, because a lot of times I'll be able to watch a lot of um, actors. There's a lot of like real serious, like method actors that, that do, um, interview interviews on YouTube and whatnot and if you listen to the way they talk about how they prepare for roles it's it's just like us they're the mental side of it uh, they hate watching themselves you know when the movie comes out and they got to sit and watch it they hate it you could it, it very often so as fighters we're our worst critic I couldn't watch my own fights with people until I had maybe 20 fights I'd be like, they like, oh, let's watch your fight. I'm like, nah, I'm good, I'm good. And then they're all like, oh, that was good. I'm like, oh, it's awful. You know, it's like, you're, you should be your worst critic. You know, you should be able to be hard on yourself and, and be able to say, ah, fuck, this is where I messed up, you know? So I think it's important. Just, just trust that you'll be better. Yeah. Sweet, guys. That brings us to about 11:10. Uh, Cub's got to shoot out of here in a minute, guys. But feel free to hang out. I'm sure you can get a, a picture with Cub. He's always super friendly with that stuff. Um, thank you all for coming. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Mel and Ash, for setting us up. Virus for for having us. I'm um, really excited. Hopefully, we're going to do a few more of these types of things. Like I said, a lot more stuff to come. A lot more, you know, gear coming out. Um, there is 35% off in store today. If you guys want to try anything out, um, I recommend this X form. This is probably one of my favorite garments that, that these guys have. You're literally fellas put it on you'll be bigger <laughs> instantly changes your posture it's probably one of the coolest things um like i said that they have one of my favorite pieces um, of gear but other than that thank you guys for coming really really appreciate it of course thank you cub for coming give him a round of applause everybody appreciate it <laughs> excellent sweet all good cool cool